Welcome to the introduction of Deuterstones. So this segment is going to cover the invertebrates um, that are also Deuterstones. So if you remember, we covered all of invertebrates before, however, they were protostomes. Now we're going to cover the Deuterstones. And remember, this is the end of chapter 33. And then we're going to be moving into chapter 34 when we move to chordates. The invertebrates that are also deuterostomes are um, the echinoderms. So here it says the echinoderms and the chordates are deuterostomes. Well, that is true. However, um, there is some major difference between the echinoderms and the chordates. The echinoderms are invertebrates that are uh, mostly marine, and um, they don't have any characteristics of chordates. The chordates includes the major group of, of animals that have vertebrae. However, there are some basal groups that are chordates, um, and so they have characteristics of chordates that do not have vertebrae. But that will be discussed more in chapter 34. So let's look a little bit more detail at the echinoderms. So the phylum is actually echinodermata, and that includes the sea stars and the sea urchins and some other organisms that are not sea stars or sea urchins. And again, these are invertebrates. They do not have vertebrae. The echinoderms and the chordates, uh, and again, the chordates includes the vertebrates, constitute the major clade of animals that are deuterostomes. The deuterostomes share several developmental characteristics. A couple of the key ones are one, radial cleavage, so during early development, uh, the stages in which they are undergoing rapid cleavage, it's in the radial format. And the second one is the uh, blastopore becomes the anus of the organism, as opposed to the protostomes where they Now let's look at some general characteristics of echinoderms. Now, some of these characteristics do not apply to some of the groups of echinoderms, but as a whole, these are um, some general characteristics of them. Um, one, they are generally very slow moving or even sessile. They don't move at all. So the sea stars are, are one of those examples that are very slow moving. And they are marine animals. They also have a thin epidermis that covers an endoskeleton, and this endoskeleton is made out of hard cal calcareous plates. Calcareous really means that it's kind of made out of calcium carbonate. So it's almost like a shell, but it's not. Echinoderms also have a unique water vascular system. The water vascular system is basically a network of hydraulic canals which branch leading to the tube feet. And the tube feet actually function in locomotion for the most part and sometimes feeding. Males and females of these groups are usually separate. And the sexual reproduction is external. And what that means is that both the males and females are going to release their gametes, their eggs and their sperm into the environment, which is going to be a marine environment. And then they um, fertilize outside of the organism. Now let's take a look at the sea star, uh, structure of the sea star. We can see the, uh, the whole endo, the, the, the uh, endoskeleton of of the sea star, which includes a lot of characteristics, which, you know, we have. They have uh, actually two stomachs, and which isn't really identified here, but you will do that in the lab. So they have two stomachs, and the mouth and the anus are really kind of, not really in the same location. They, um, they are in the same uh, area, which is the central part of the sea star. And um, the anus is uh, at the top, and then the mouth is down um, underneath, uh, which we can't see here. Now, each of the five arms, okay, so there's five arms in the sea star. Each of the five arms contain all of these, these things. They have digestive glands, which lead to the stomachs. They have radial canals which uh, lead to the ring canal, and the ring canal is along the center of the whole organism. And they have gonads. So it's important to remember that 
all three of these, the digestive glands, the radial canals, and the gonads, exist in every single one of these five arms. It's just we're seeing them separate for um, simplicity. Now, if we look at a close-up of an arm, this is really like a cross-section of an arm, you can see a radial nerve. So we've got the radial um, nerve, which runs along the radial uh, canal, and um, the ampullae, which is part of the radial canal, um, or the, the uh, water vascular system, really. And you can see the ampullae, which are these spherical-like structures, they lead all the, way, all the way through from the inside of the organism to the outside, leading to the tube feet. And these, um, the name of that, the proper name is podium. So remember, podia are associated with feet. Now, let's just take a look at a little video of this, um, of an echinoderm of a sea star walking. Okay, so we can see the little two feet moving really fast. At the ends of the two feet are, um, are suckers. You can see the madreporite. The madreporite is kind of important because this is really um, part of the water vascular system. And this is the location of the madreporite makes it um, n not radial in terms of symmetry. So you can see how slow they move. This is actually, well, this is real time here, but the previous, um, speed was eight times its normal speed. So you can see a little close up of the feet here. And again, this is eight times its normal speed. All right, so let's look at some more characteristics. Um, so as you could see from the previous uh, images and the description of the structures that make up a sea star, the adult echinoderms that appear um, radial uh, generally have multiples of five in terms of symmetry. So they have radial symmetry with multiples of five. And the term for this is called pentaradial. Their symmetry is not truly radial though. Remember, these are um, part of the group of animals called the bilaterians. So the opening of the water vascular system, the madreporite, is not central, so it's not really in the center of the organism. It's it's kind of a little bit lateral to the center. So this is part of what makes it um, not radial, um, makes it a bilaterian. But also, the larvae have bi So let's talk about living echinoderms. Um, the living echinoderms at this point are divided into five clades. We're going to look at the structures and the characteristics of each clade. So we've got one, Asteroidea. The Asteroidea include the sea stars and sea daisies. The Ophiuroidea include the Bertel stars, which are very similar to the, key, the sea stars, except they have some key differences. The Echinoidea, which include the sea urchins and the sand dollars. The crinoidea, which include the sea lilies and the feather stars. And finally, the holothuroidea, which include the sea cucumbers, which are really a unique set of organisms on their own. All right, so let's start with the asteroidea. Again, the asteroidea includes the group of sea stars and sea daisies. Let's look at some characteristics of each one separately. So the sea stars, they have multiple arms, five arms specifically, that radiate out from a central disk area. The undersurface of each arm has tube feet. These tube feet allow them to grip to substrate because they have adhesive chemicals and suckers at the ends of them. They feed on bivalves by prying them open with their tube feet. And then they evert their stomach. Basically, their stomach just kind of blows up out of their body on the underside. And then they digest their prey by externally, right, using the digestive enzymes. What's interesting about these is very similar to planaria and some other worms is that um, if they, in this case, if they lose an arm, they can regenerate the arm so they can regrow that arm if they lost one or more. 
Now the sea daisies are quite different from the sea stars, but they are also asteroidia. The sea daisies lack arms, so they don't have that uh, pentaradial symmetry, and their adult form seems more radial. However, remember, they are bilaterians. There are only three species of this group that are known. They live on wood that's been submerged into the ocean, and they absorb nutrients through a membrane that it surrounds their entire body. Ophiuroidea include the brittle stars, and like I said before, the brittle stars look very similar to the sea stars. But the differences include this distinct central disc and the very thin, long, more flexible arms that they have, and they use those for movement. And some species are sent suspension feeders, while others are actually predators or scavengers. Now, Echinoidea, again, include the sea urchins and the sand dollars. These appear to have radial symmetry. However, remember, they are also bilaterians. Both of them have no arms, very similar to the previous group. And they do have five rows of two feet. They use their spines for locomotion often and protection, of course. And what's interesting is that the sea urchins appear more um, spherical and some of them have very long spines and the sand dollars are more flat. Now, um, they generally feed on seaweed um, using this jaw-like structure that they have on their underside. And they're, like I said, they're roughly symmetrical. Um, they appear to be radial, some have radial symmetry, but they, again, they are bilaterians and the sand dollars are more full. Now, crinoidea include the sea lilies, as in this one on the left, and the feather stars, as in this one on the right. So they look very much like plant-like, or um, some of the plant-like protists, but these are actually animals. The sea lilies, as like an example on the left, have, um, they generally are sessile, and they live actually attached to a, or a substrate in the ocean by a stalk, and the feather stars actually move around a little bit more freely than the sea lilies. They can crawl using these long, flexible arms that they have. Both of them use their arms to feed by uh, suspension feeding. Holothuroidea include the sea cucumbers. You can see the sea cucumbers are very different from all of the other groups of echinoderms. They do not have spines when you look um, much closer um, so on their surface. They have a very reduced endoskeleton, so as opposed to all of the uh, complicated structures that seem to be in the sea star, theirs are a little bit more simplistic on the inside. They do not like, like much of the echinoderms, and you, as you can see, they uh, have an adult form that actually is bilateral, as opposed to many of the other echinoderms. They also have five rows of two feet, very similar to the sea urchins. Now you can see this um, down here at the bottom of this image. And some of these are uh, basically developed as, as feeding tentacles, so they're, they're a lot different than tube feet in some species within this group. So we've taken a look at all of the groups of chinoderms, and again, the chinoderms are also deuterostomia, so if you look at this table that's present in your textbook, all the, if we just kind of review, quickly review, you probably already learned about the periphera, which is the set of basal, basal, includes the basal groups of all animals, the nideria, and then, of course, these uh, include the bilaterians, and the bilaterians include the lophotrochozoa and lactizozoa, which happen to be protostomes, 
And here, um, some of the bilaterians, of course, are going to be deuterostomes. So we just cover the echinodermata. It's important to remember that the echinodermata are coelomate, so they have a true coelom. They have bilateral symmetry, whether it's their larva or the adult form. They have a unique water vascular system and an endoskeleton. And we looked at the details of the sea star. Our next uh, topic, which will be the subject of chapter 34, are the rest of the deuterostomes called the chordata. So chordata include the, um, the basal groups of chordates and all of the many different uh, diverse vertebrate groups. So let's do a quick overview of this. Again, this is chapter 34. It consists of two basal groups of invertebrates and the large vertebrate group. So the two basal groups of invertebrates include the lancelets and the tunicates. It's important to remember that they do not have vertebrae. However, they do belong to the phylum chordata. They have bilateral symmetry. So we're talking about all the chordata here bilateral symmetry. They are also um, coelomates, so they have a true coelom. They have segmented bodies, so all of them have segmented bodies. And what's interesting is that um, even though the chordates are also deuterostomes, they evolve separately from the echinoderms. And they've been evolving separately from the echinoderms for at least 500 million years. All right, thank you for listening.